Hey there, I am in Roscoe, Illinois at Historic Auto Attractions. Now this museum has actually been towards the top of my list of places that I want to go to that's realistic um, for quite a while and it's taken uh, quite a while to get up here. Uh, it's only open during the summer, but this place is not as boring as it might sound. I mean, that's a good name, but uh, that does not convey everything they have here. Um, so stay tuned, uh, we're gonna go really in depth. There's gonna be uh, one or two or three parts. I'm not sure yet, um, but this is gonna be good. So let's go check this place out. All right, so we're gonna head in and see what all historic auto attractions is about. We are being welcomed by a creepy old butler guy to one of the greatest museums ever to exist. This place is located inside an industrial park north of Rockford. There's not a lot around here, and there's not a lot of visitors who come here. The museum is located here because it's close to the workplace of its owner, Wayne Lensing. He owns left-hander Chases, which builds and manufactures Chases for short track racing, and distributes race car parts. The business has been successful and has allowed him to amass one of the best private collections in the country. This is a 1906 Orient Buckboard. It was advertised as the cheapest automobile in the world at $375, and it could go up to 30 miles an hour. The best part about this museum is that that buckboard we just saw was just about the least rare and unusual thing at this museum. Almost everything is very historically important, tied to some famous person, event, or thing. I did end up spending six hours going through. Here are some taxidermy lions right by the entrance to the main exhibits. First off, the turn of the century, which is more of an exhibit on the American West. This is a vintage blow apart display of the Model 39 Winchester rifle. That's a war tunic, tomahawk, and bow from the mid 1800s. This is a Springfield Model 1866 rifle with some modifications made by Native Americans, but this rifle was used at the Wounded Knee Massacre. This is a Winchester Model 1866 lever action musket used at the Battle of Little Bighorn, supposedly by Chief Spotted Elk. He was chief of the Minneconju Sioux, and he ended up getting killed at Wounded Knee. There's an 1873 Springfield, decorated by a Native American, and a decorated shotgun from the Wind River Reservation. A very old bison skull found in Iowa, that may be 5,000 years old, and there's a younger bison skull that was also found near the Big Sioux River. A collection of other Native American artifacts, like arrowheads. This is the Hatchet of He-Dog, a Lakota warrior. He put the five notches in the axe handle, one for each battle he fought in, which included the Fetterman battle and Rosebud. He also fought at Little Bighorn. That's a Sioux scalping knife. Wonder how many scalps this one cut. That is the signature of Sitting Bull. This was actually a souvenir cart from Buffalo Bill's Wild West show, dated 1884. He did perform with the show after the Indian Wars of the 1870s. There's a headdress, crossbow, and a newspaper describing the Battle of Little Bighorn, Custer's romanticized last stand, where his entire cavalry regiment got killed, and that is General George Custer's autograph. This is an 1869 cavalry tunic from the 32nd Infantry. It was worn by William Yates, who was stationed at Camp Goodwin in Arizona Territory during the Apache Wars. These are wax figures of General Custer, Clint Eastwood, and John Wayne. This museum has as many wax figures as an actual wax museum. That's James Arnes's costume worn as Marshall Dillon in Gunsmoke, and that piano next to it was used in Gunsmoke, the longest running drama or western series in TV history. That's Mary Blanchard's green saloon dress worn in the 1954 western Destry, and Dorothy Malone's dress from Law & Order, where she starred alongside Ronald Reagan. That is a prop passenger train coach car and caboose used by MGM when filming train scenes in the 1930s and 40s. And they made this thing look like a real moving train. Movie magic. That is John Wayne's cowboy hat, used in some Warner Brother productions. 
that's Pierce Lydon's cowboy hat. He was a western actor who appeared in over 300 films and 100 TV shows. That is World War II hero Audie Murphy's nudies ostrich boots and his scarf. Murphy was an actor after the war and was in quite a few westerns like Destry and Gunsmoke. John Wayne's personal shoehorn engraved with the word Duke and his personalized engraved decorative cigarette case. That is Tom Mix's cowboy hat. He was the king of the cowboys in the 1930s and he appeared in over a hundred cowboy movies, then died in a horrific car crash. That is Gary Cooper's original grave marker from Holy Cross Cemetery in Culver City. He passed away in 1961 and this was his grave for 13 years. Then he was exhumed and moved to Southampton, New York. Those are the cowboy boots of Duncan Ronaldo. There's a badge and key from the Joliet, Illinois prison, a Wells Fargo belt buckle, and an Alcatraz guard badge. This is a three-page letter from Josephine Earp, Wyatt Earp's wife, to Mrs. Breeson, a relative of the guy who owned the famous Long Branch Saloon in Dodge City. This is a model 1878 Colt 45 revolver and holster of Rose Dunn, also known as the Rose of Cimarron. This is Bill Tillman's revolver. He was an important Wild West lawman in the Oklahoma Territory. This is a Kit Carson inscribed rifle receiver that was found on the border of Texas and New Mexico. Those are original Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid reward posters. They both say wanted, dead, or alive. This is Frank James's revolver. He was the older brother of Jesse James. He was a Confederate guerrilla like Jesse and did some robberies, but he stopped after his brother was killed. These are Jesse James's spurs. He was one of the most famous bank and train robbers in American history. And this was Jesse James's revolver. It is believed that he killed eight men using this colt, and while James was being pursued by officers swimming his horse across the Missouri River, he accidentally dropped this gun in the water. When the river realigned 20 years later, this was found, and it still has a bullet loaded by Jesse James inside of it. This is the signature of Buffalo Bill Cody, originally a Pony Express rider and army scout, but he became most famous for the legendary Buffalo Bill's Wild West show, and he toured the country for over 30 years. This relic is pretty awesome. It's a beaded deerskin jacket that was worn by Buffalo Bill. It is dated 1894. This is a traveling trunk used during the Wild West show. This one is dated to 1885. And this is a Winchester Model 1866 rifle that belonged to Buffalo Bill. He might have used this during the show or to hunt buffalo. This old blunderbuss is believed to have been owned by a pilgrim in New England, and it was made in the 1700s. This one is very awesome. John Coulter's flintlock rifle. He was a member of the Lewis and Clark expedition, but stayed out west to explore Yellowstone, Jackson Hole, and other regions of the west. In case you haven't seen enough Wild West guns, here's plenty more in this cabinet. This was Annie Oakley's shotgun. Little Miss Sure Shot had this gun ordered and converted into a rifle by her husband Frank Butler, and the museum claims that this was her favorite gun. Texas Sheriff John H. Slaughter's shotgun, an Arizona Ranger shotgun, and a Virginia and Truckee Railroad double barrel shotgun, used to keep order among those seeking the Comstock load. These are wagon wheel hubs from the Donner Party expedition. These were witness to the cannibalism among its members during the horrid winter trapped up in the Sierra Nevada mountains. This is an 1860 horse-drawn hearse that was used in Billings, Montana, which was not all too far from the Battle of Little Bighorn. This is a genuine Wells Fargo Overland Stage U.S. Mail Stagecoach. Where the railroads ended, Wells Fargo had to use stagecoaches, and they eventually owned the largest stagecoach empire in the world. This coach was part of the Butterfield Line, the regular twice-a-week mail service between St. Louis and San Francisco, starting in 1857. 
And here are wax figures of the two main characters from Bonanza, the second longest running western in history. There's Michael Landon and Dan Blocker. They also have Bonanza's Ben Cartwright on an old wagon, and a 1924 Fordson tractor in the background. They even throw in an old school taxidermy display with all sorts of wildlife, not necessarily native to Illinois, but most of these are somewhere on the continent. This guy is pretty rare, a harbor spotted seal. And that was just the first exhibit. Now we're moving on to the 1920s and 1930s in gangster land. This is a Bonnie and Clyde death car. The infamous duo were ambushed in this stolen car in Louisiana in 1934, and they were shot at no less than 167 times. It was quite the grisly death. The real car is at Whiskey Pete's Casino in Prim, Nevada. This is a replica car made for the 1967 film Bonnie and Clyde, starting Warren Beatty and Faye Dunaway. The bullet holes are real. The car was shot out with a 45 caliber Thompson submachine gun. Next to the car are the actual hats worn by Clyde Barrow and Bonnie Parker in the car on May 23rd, 1934 when they were killed. This small sequin tam style hat that Bonnie was wearing does have a bullet hole right to the head. And there's a bullet hole on the back brim of Clyde's fedora. That's a Smith & Wesson revolver and some bullets that were taken from the death car. That's a swatch of cloth from the wool pants that Clyde was wearing when he was killed. This 22 Colt rifle was used by Ray Hamilton. A member of Bonnie and Clyde's gang in 1934, he is believed to have used this during an armed robbery in Texas, and Bonnie attempted to burn this rifle by setting it on fire in an outhouse after a shootout with police. Historic Auto Attractions probably has the best Dillinger collection on display now, after Indiana's Dillinger Museum closed again. Dillinger used this 1932 Studebaker Commander as a getaway car after he robbed the Central National Bank in Greencastle, Indiana in October of 1933. When police swarmed the bank, they didn't think to block off his getaway car. It was actually a stolen unmarked sheriff's vehicle. The Greencastle robbery ended up being the largest bank robbery in history by that point. Dillinger stole over $75,000. This was John Dillinger's bulletproof vest, which he left at the Little Bohemia Lodge when he evaded an FBI raid there. And he also left this Colt 45 revolver at the Little Bohemia. This badge was worn by the arresting constable during the raid at Little Bohemia. There's a gun flash compressor used by Dillinger's gang and Dillinger's Colt 45 caliber. Here are a whole bunch of big guns that were owned by Dillinger. Some of these guns he used belong to his father and grandfather. On July 22nd, 1934, John Dillinger left the Biograph Theater in Chicago and was surprised by a police attack there. And this is the gun used by East Chicago officer Martin Zarkovich to fire the fatal shot that killed John Dillinger. Some badges of Chief Wallard. He was successful at arresting Dillinger in Tucson, Arizona. And that is a John Dillinger death mask. One thing I've noticed in my travels to museums is that there are a lot of John Dillinger death masks. But Historic Auto Attractions claims this to be the actual death mask cast on Dillinger's dead face by the coroner. Dillinger went on a movie date to the Biograph with the lady in red to see Manhattan Melodrama. And this was Clark Gable's suit that he wore in that movie, the last movie Dillinger saw just before his death. This is a 1929 Ford Model AA used in Al Capone's bootlegging operations during Prohibition. This rum runner may have been used to get liquor from either his East Coast connections or from the Purple Gang in Detroit, and this operation made Capone very rich and powerful in Chicago. Capone lived and worked out of the Lexington Hotel in downtown Chicago, and these were the vault doors to his office there. He had all sorts of secret passages and stairways that led to hidden tunnels under the city to connect taverns, warehouses, 
houses, and to provide escapes from police raids and attacks by rivals. There is a heck of a lot more to see in this museum. Please check out part two of Historic Auto Attractions, and thanks for watching.